So uh, my thanks to Carrie Turk for leading the children's sermon because she and I were on the same wavelength. As I uh, thought about how to start this sermon, I thought, what is it that we want more of? Do we want more ice cream or more bagels or more coffee or more money or more time or more peace? There's so many things that we want more of. And maybe, like she said, there are some times when we're afraid to ask for those things or when we know that asking for those things would be bad. But um, there's more, a longing for more in our hearts, I think. And so as we've been um, working through why all of these things matter, we wanted this one last tap on the series to say, why is it that we need to continue to press on toward faith, press on toward continuing to grow in what God has to teach us, continuing to work toward something more. And so uh, as we think about this, I wanted to share with you an example that I heard from a friend of mine in college. Uh, she was a chemistry major, and uh, she was giving this talk about uh, Bible study and how we continue to study the Bible even after we've read it once or twice. And um, she gave this example. She started with sugar. And she said, sugar is this very common thing that we all know about. We learn about it pretty early on in life, right? When you uh, are two, you get to go trick-or-treating or maybe even earlier, and you learn about sugar, and it's good, right? We learn that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And we, and very little kids learn uh, this. I, I swear Michael, um, at uh, like 12 months of age, had it figured out which packages had sugar in them and which didn't. And he knew, I don't want that. That's a vegetable. I do want that. It's got sugar, right? From a very early age, we figure out that sugar is a good thing. But as you get older, you learn more and more about it. Um, and you learn that it's not just for sweetening food and making uh, your taste buds happy, but that it also is a food for plants, and it's part of the building blocks for a lot of other things. And so then maybe you go on in science and you learn about photosynthesis and you learn that sugar is like C6H12O6. And then if you continue to go on, as my friend did in chemistry, then you start to be able to build molecules and you learn about where there's a double bond here and a single bond there. And and after that, she lost me, but she kept talking on and on and on about sugar and how complex uh, this very simple thing is. And then, and this is what I really remember and what I want to highlight today. She said, this is how our faith works too. We can have a basic understanding of like, oh, hey, Jesus, he's sweet. Um, or, oh, church, that's good. And we like it. And there is a general level at which we understand that Jesus loves us and we love him too. And that's good. But that's like a toddler understanding of our faith. And we're not called to stop there. We're called to keep growing and discovering. And so we learn all of the different bonds that Christ has in our lives and how we're called to be bonded to others. And we're called to continue to explore the complexities of our faith and our triune God. Now, I wasn't a chemistry major in college, but I was an education major. And I learned uh, in studying how people learn that our learning doesn't just go like steep up a mountain and in this nice smooth trajectory. What our, our learning does is that we go up for a while and then we plateau and then we go up for a while and then we plateau. And sometimes like climbing an actual mountain, the way that we learn is like switchbacks where you feel like you're going over the same material over and over again. But that each time you go slightly higher and that there's more learning and more things happening. And so this is also true of our faith. Now, sometimes when we're learning, we go up and up and up and we feel like we're doing really well. And then we plateau and we think nothing's happening and we stop and we give up 
and we quit learning. And, and again, sometimes this happens with our faith too, and that is a problem if you give up on the plateaus. If you think, I am too old to sing about the B-I-B-L-E, and I'm too sore to sleep on an air mattress in a school gym during a youth group trip, and I don't want to do anything else. I've read through all of James Moore's books or Philip Yancey's books or whoever your favorite author is, and I'm done. And you think that you're on this plateau that is actually the end when it's not the end, that there's more. There's another rise ahead. There's the switchbacks will change soon, and it, you'll go on a different side of the mountain, and you'll begin it to continue discovering. You see, our faith is about climbing for more and discovering more. And so... As we look at our passage today, it's found in the book of Philippians. Now, Philippians is actually a letter to uh, the people in Philippi, and it's written by a pastor. Sometimes we forget that, that uh, the Apostle Paul, as we call him, was a pastor. He was a pastor who was interested in starting churches, but also in helping people grow in their faith. And Philippi was a sort of retirement community. It was a place where Roman soldiers often retired. It was right on the seaside. I often imagine it as a nice Floridian, comfortable kind of community. And there in Philippi, Paul was talking to them about what it meant to move beyond the plateaus of life and to continue to press on for more. He tells them in chapter 3, if you're to read the whole of chapter 3, he tells them about his early life, how he had been a law-abiding Jewish family, how he had followed all of the rules, and he had gone on this perfect path to be the best religious scholar that there was. He uh, wanted to uh, uh, follow all of the rules and get it all right, but none of it was enough. And you may know this about Paul. He had this um, blinded by the light experience on the road to Damascus as he was trying to persecute the Christians. And he encountered Jesus in this life-shattering way that changed the, the way that he thought about things. But in this moment of encountering Jesus, something else changed and he began to desire more. Not just to follow rules and follow the law and know Hebrew really well, but he desired to know Christ more in a relationship, in, in a live it out every day kind of way. He wanted to know it more. So even after completing his Ivy League religious education, Paul still had more to learn. He started dozens of churches and helped hundreds and thousands of people to learn about Jesus. But even after he's done all of that, he writes this letter to the Philippians, and this is near the end of his life, and he's writing it from a jail cell, mind you. He writes, not that I have obtained this goal, but I press on for more. Isn't that amazing? Paul sitting there, pastor premier, in a jail cell, suffering for his faith, um, having done miles and miles more on his journey of faith than most of us have done, he says, I haven't already obtained the goal of my faith of knowing Christ completely, but I still have to press on. There's still something more there. And so if you're following along on your outline, um, the first blank there, the main point of this sermon, is that more matters because there's much to be done. There's so much to be done in our faith and in our journey of walking with Christ and knowing God. There's so much more to be done. And so Paul says in verse 10, is this passage where we started reading, he says he wants to know Christ more. And this is our ultimate challenge as well. Um, 
we want to know Christ more. We don't assume that we know Jesus just because we've heard people in, t- in church talking about Jesus. We want to spend time really studying the Gospels and really getting to know Jesus on a personal level. And not just reading about him in a book, but getting to know him on, at a personal level. And so we need to challenge ourselves to get to know Christ better in our prayer life, to really deepen our life of prayer, to trust that God cares about the details of our lives, the ups and the downs. We need to get to know Christ better as we read the Bible and read the stories about him. We need to know Christ more as we try to imitate his life and try to love others as Jesus loved loved them. And so as we think about, well, how did Jesus love others? How do we get to know Christ by imitating him? I want to skip down to blank number three um, and talk about share in suffering more. Um, Paul says he wants to share in the sufferings of Christ. And this makes us a little uncomfortable to share in the sufferings of Christ and make become more like him in his death. And sometimes this statement and this concept gets twisted around in a Christian church, so I want to be very careful here and say that I don't think that sharing in the sufferings of Christ means that we need to go get some sort of torture device and start practicing self-mutilations. And I don't think that abuse is ever okay. If you're living in an abusive relationship, don't think that this verse is calling you to endure more abuse from a loved one or suffer for your faith. Sharing in the sufferings of Christ is not about enduring personal torture just for torture's sake. Sharing in the sufferings of Christ is about walking with others and hearing their pain and telling them that Christ has suffered for us and with us, and that God loves us more than we can imagine. That's what sharing in the sufferings of Christ means. When we look at how Jesus lived, he taught us that we should see people like the woman at the well who we talked about last week and stop and have a conversation with them. That we need to see Zacchaeus hiding up in the tree and see his loneliness and his shame and say, I want to come to dinner at your house. We need to weep with Mary at the grave of her brother. And uh, we need to have this empathy for others. And we need to suffer in a way that shows that responding to hate with more hate doesn't work, but that we want to love and suffer with others. Paul states that he wants to share in the death of Christ, not just in the sufferings of Christ, but also in the death of Christ. And this, again, gets to be really complicated. How do you do that? And so um, as we looked at this, we wanted, I want to lift up three ideas that in death, Christ was humble. He told the disciples that he could call down an army of angels but he didn't because that wasn't part of God's plan. He could have used his authority to bully and dominate from the very beginning, but he didn't. If you flip back to chapter 2 in Philippians, you'll see Paul reminding us of Christ's humility. It says he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but instead humbled himself and became obedient, obedient to death, even death on a cross, that Christ was willing to be humble and obedient in his death. And we are called to be the same, to trust and obey, if you will. Um, But Christ was also forgiving and compassionate. To the soldiers who nailed him on the cross, he cried, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And to the thief next to him on the cross, he was compassionate. He gave comfort saying, today you will be with me in paradise. Now those things we talk about a lot, Um, And so maybe it doesn't strike you as being unusual that Christ was forgiving and compassionate. But remember, again, that death on a cross was like 
the worst way to die. You hung there and literally suffocated to death as your diaphragm closed and you couldn't breathe in anymore. And so as Christ is suffering there on the cross, he has the clarity to ask for forgiveness for those who put him there and to ask for compassion for the man who is a thief who's next to him on the cross. We're called to be humble and forgiving and compassionate, just as Christ was in his death, to share in his sufferings. Now, in trying to uh, live like Jesus in his life and his death, it can be a temptation maybe, although I'm not sure that's quite the right word, to think that we have to then be Jesus. Um, and, and I don't think any of us ever think I'm going to be Jesus, but sometimes we take on jobs that belong to Jesus. And what I mean is this, that sometimes when we suffer with others, as Christ has called us to do, instead of taking all of that pain um, that we've walked with others with, we take it on ourselves and we forget to lift it up to Christ. And we take on all of these sufferings of the world and we put on all of this pain and we wear it like it's our burden to bear. But I don't think that that's, again, what Christ called us to do. And so as we tease out this verse 10, um, we see that before Paul said, I'm going to share in the sufferings and the death of Christ, what he first said is, I'm going to live, um, share in the resurrection. Um, and it, so we are called, and this is uh, blank number two on your list, uh, we are called to live the resurrected life more. We are to know the power of resurrection, and I think that this is the answer to the compassion fatigue that we sometimes feel. Sometimes, again, we're doing good things, we're going and we're serving, and we see the pain of this world, and it's overwhelming. It is. It's overwhelming. But what the resurrection reminds us of, sharing in the power of the resurrection, reminds us that there is hope beyond this world, that there is more to this life than what we can see, that there is no power that is stronger than the love of God. There is no evil that is so intense that it cannot be defeated by the love of God. You see, if Jesus hadn't been resurrected, then all of his talk about how I could call down angel armies might seem like just, um, just talk. But the fact that he died and rose again shows us that the darkest of evils cannot be overcome by the love of God. So when we care for others, when we suffer with others, when we walk with others in their pain, we don't do it alone. We do it with the power of of resurrection. We do it with the idea that we have the power of the only one who can transform the world. We lift their uh, our problems and our troubles and the troubles of others up to God who can take those burdens and bear them well. We don't live as people without hope. We live as people who claim the power of the resurrection. And so uh, Paul urges us to know Christ, to know his suffering, to share in the resurrection, not just in one moment, but to continue to press on, to continue to press on towards these things. And this is what I really love, because I think that sometimes in the church we leave you with the idea that um, if you've prayed once, that that's enough, <laughs> or that if you've been baptized um, that you should be happy, happy, happy all the time. And that's not the reality. You know that, and I know that, and Paul knows that. He says we've got to press on. And that doesn't mean that God's grace isn't good enough in our baptism uh, or that we need 
or that that prayer that we initially prayed asking for God to come into our lives wasn't enough. It was good. But like that example of sugar that I gave you earlier, um, it's always the same sugar. The sugar you encounter as a toddler is the same sugar that the chemist studies at a molecular level. But your understanding of it changes, right? It's always the same grace, but our understanding of who God is and how God works in our lives changes. And as we discover these deeper levels, we find that God is more than we ever imagined before. And so here's what I want to say. If, and this is, this is one example of how we can press deeper. If sermons on Sunday morning are beginning to feel a bit dull or a bit shallow or a bit uh, not quite enough, that's a good thing. And it, it hope maybe means that I need to work harder, but it also, I think, it means that you are longing for more, that there's something beyond 15 minutes, 20 minutes on a Sunday that, that there is to learn. There's something else. So if it's become a bit boring on Sunday, go pick up an upper room and start reading that every, every day. And if you've already done that, and that gets a bit shallow and tiring to you, go pick up a Bible in the year plan and start reading it every single day. And if that becomes a bit tedious after you've done it three, four, five times, then come talk to me, uh, and I'll set you up so that you can start teaching. Because <laughs> guess what? When you start teaching it, you find out there's a whole lot you didn't understand before, and you come to all sorts of new levels of growth and understanding. And if you have started teaching and that becomes a bit dull, then we'll send you to seminary. And you can learn all sorts of other things about teaching others. Because there's always more. There's always more to learn, always more to grow into. And, and this doesn't happen just in Bible study. It happens in prayer. It happens in service. It happens in all sorts of levels. We press on. Press on to reach the goal to which Christ has called us heavenward. We press on to know Christ better, to know our faith better. We press on because there is much to be done.